Okay, you know you're a little book obsessed. Okay, you know you're a little booktube obsessed when you're watching booktube while setting up your camera. We're gonna call this the awkward angle, but I can't find the tripod. I think it's up in Kat's room. Not really sure. I thought I brought it down here, but obviously I didn't. So awkward angle, contemporary-a-thon. I'm never gonna pronounce it right, you guys. I'm so sorry. Contemporary-a-thon wrap up. It's like two weeks too late, maybe three now. But my girls had fall break last week and hubs the girls and I went down to Southern Cal to check out another university, or actually three universities, for Cat. And yeah, so I didn't get a chance to film. I know. Also, stay tuned because the very next video is going to be an unboxing. I haven't done one of those in literally, I think, a year. Pretty close. But there's going to be a giveaway for my second anniversary in book two. So, and this one's like really good. So anyway, contemporary thon. Hubs picked out the books. I'm gonna link the original TBR video with him there. And uh, one of the books was Brave New World by Aldux Huxley. The reason he picked this out is because Kat's gonna be starring. She has a couple of minor roles in it in her high school production of this book. Now, when this book came out, I thought it was more contemporary, but it came out pretty much at the same time as my favorite dystopian of all time, 1984 by George Orwell. In fact, I read the back, and if you guys get this edition, it's the Harper Perennial Modern Classics, there are some extra bonus materials at the end, one of which is a letter from Aldous to George Orwell upon reading his book, 1984. So I found out a little more biographical information about Mr. Huxley, and, you know, I found out, um, some of the challenges he faced like he was completely blind in one eye and he is an author it's just amazing the things that we can overcome the book itself is a little bit you know out there for me it's a dystopian about this perfect world that's been created with basically designer babies pretty crazy because this was written in like the 1930s and Aldous Huxley was a big fan of science so he was really staying up on all the current scientific papers that were out um, and so now there's no reason to you know make babies the old-fashioned way if you will they're all done in a series of like labs and that's people are sorted by alpha plus, alpha, betas, etc. So the whole society is put together in classes all the way down to, I can't remember what the bottom level was, I think it was gammas or something. The, those people were just in charge of like manual labor and the alphas of course were in charge of society itself. There was one kind of uh, president, if you will, and uh, there were people that, you know, uh, were as the human spirit does, trying to rebel against the society, or at least questioning what were the societal norms. So did I like the book? I did. Did it take me by surprise? It did. Is it better than 1984? No. But probably it's more of a case of it's not the book, it's more me and my taste. I like the fact 1984 is really structured. It's The world is just truly horrific. Uh, this is more modern, if you will, and it's something that you could totally kind of sort of see happening. I don't see a stratifying society into the different, you know, alpha, beta, gamma, whatever layers, but um, at times I think we're not too far from that, so it makes you question the world. Into this world, there's a savage area, and some of the people from the Alphas go and they explore this savage area. It's very Native American in feel, and they take back a savage into their world. And then the story follows kind of how the savage uh, acquiesces or doesn't into the world. So it really makes you question everything. And the ending is amazing. And that's all I'm gonna say. So if you haven't read it like me, please do. And then we can talk about it all you want. I'm out there on Twitter and Instagram. Please, please, if you've read it, let's talk. Cause I need to talk to someone about this. The next book that Hubs picked out was the Guernsey 
Literary and Potato Peel Society. This is a book that I meant to read for a previous readathon, you know me, but I finally finished it and I finished it in Los Angeles. It is a beautifully set story in World War, post World War II England. There's a bit of a romance. It's about a writer who wrote kind of a tongue in cheek column during the war. She was in London and she finds out from her publisher about this society on the Guernsey Island, which was actually occupied by the British. Now, I know like that much about World War II history you know, whatever my American public education has uh, allowed. Mostly it's about the Allies and the Nazis and concentration camps. I had no idea that the Nazis had gone all the way up to the Channel Islands. So they were right there, right in front of England. Um, and it's about how those people on that island survived the occupation. Uh, they did start a literary society, just like me, when times are tough, they escaped into books. And it's, there's just sweet, heartwarming, heart-wrenching stories, and a romance vis-a-vis -vis an American editor or publisher that comes into play and kind of wants to steal the writer away from her publishing house in England, which is run by her brother-in-law, uh, as well as steal her heart, I think. So I really, really enjoyed it. For my historical buffs that love all the BBC productions out there, I'm dying to see the Netflix production of the movie. I hope it's very faithful to the book. I really, really, really love this book. I'm adding in a couple of extra books because there was one book that I hadn't hadn't read, and that was my precious Han Solo book. <laughs> I just didn't get to it because I read two other books that I just want to mention briefly. So um, one of the books that my husband did pick out was Brown Girl Dreaming by Jacqueline Woodson. This is a, an autobiographical memoir written in verse about her life growing up in the 1970s, I think late 60s and uh, early to mid 70s. In the United States, it starts off with her in, oh my gosh, I forgot, a Midwestern state, and then she ends up having to go to the South because her mother leaves her father, and she's raised there by her Southern grandma and grandpa with all the charm that you can imagine when you think small, segregated, so ex nay on the charm, <laughs> a Southern town, in the you know late 60s or early 70s it was charming only because of the life that the grandmother and grandfather created for the sisters and the brother um it's a tale of hardship it's a tale of overcoming incredible odds it made me cry um especially regarding the grandmother and the grandfather i was really close to both of mine so it triggered all those memories and happy feelings and just unconditional love that grandparents give you and i totally related to both the narrator and her mother who was just trying to carve out a space in this world for herself and her children as a single mom they end up in new york city again in the 70s it was just a wonderful story and I'm really looking forward to her next book which I've already checked out of the library called Harbor Me. This one has won a lot of awards for a reason. I really encourage you guys as the readathons come up and you need something that was written in verse, please, please pick this book up. You'll see why it's won the awards that it has. Okay, the last book that House picked out was a thriller. It was supposed to be something dark. He picked out Our House by Louise Candlish. Who, Nellie? This was one messed up thriller. One day, the protagonist, and I have forgotten her name, um, Fi arrives home to her house that she has shared with her ex-husband, Bram. In fact, they're in the process of divorcing, but they have something called, oh gosh, I forget what they call it, like nest or whatever, where the kids stay in the family home and the parents take turns. One week, the mother takes over, and then the next, week the dad so the, the kids don't have to bounce uh, amongst two different households they stay in the family home well she arrives to the family home to discover that there's another family moving in and what unravels is a plot involving her totally messed up husband Bram um, and just I mean the plot is crazy it's a thriller and you find out 
how it came to be that this other family has moved in. And some of the twists I did see coming, others was, were like, whoa, this is totally messed up. This would make a really, really great movie or, you know, like TV movie. Um, so if you're looking for a domestic thriller, our house will deliver for sure. Something that was completely out of my comfort zone, something that's completely in my comfort zone, I'm <laughs> gonna get a little political, Bob Woodward's Fear. I listened to this in an audiobook as well. Excellent narrator, you guys. Didn't ha even have to bump him up to 1.25 speed. This is a very logically presented timeline of the current administration and everything that's happened. Bob Woodward, as you know, most of you know, is a journalist that he dates back to the Watergate era. I was in Mir Bebe then, but, um, and I did, you know, kind of follow it along afterwards because I did major in political science, but, um, so he broke the Watergate story. He knows how to present a very logical argument, for sure, if you will. He knows how to present a very logical timeline. There is no argumentative writing. It is just presented as a series of facts, um, and I don't know what that style of journalism is called, but I guess, you know, who, what, where, when, why, and how. My favorite part comes in the back because Mr. Woodward has a series of source notes. These are freaking amazing. This is how many, sort. look at that. These are all the source notes he has. So everything, when he footnotes it, it goes back to that source and you can see where he got the information from. So in an era of fake news and, you know, other contrived BS that we're having to deal with, this is logically presented. For my friends that love audiobooks, get this one. It's really, really good. And I flew through it and so did my son. For my friends that support the administration, I encourage you to have an open mind and, you know, again, listen to it or pick it up and read it. Get it from your library. Heck, I'll even send it to you. <laughs> if you really want to read it, just let me know down below and I'll send you my copy. Because um, I think it's something that needs to be read. Facts, people, facts, not, you know, alternative truths or whatever Kellyanne Conway says. Okay, enough of the politics. So, contemporary thon wrap-up. I really enjoyed this, and thank you so much for the hosts. I will link their uh, wrap-ups below. They are amazing. They're so fun, and I really, really enjoyed this. So, what did you guys do? What have you read lately? Let me know down below. Sorry for the awkward angle. Give me a like, won't you? <laughs> <laughs> Click subscribe and please hit the bell icon because you never know when I'm going to post. Thanks so much for watching and thanks for a fabulous two years. See you later. Bye.